And so it gives me great pleasure to welcome to the second time uh, to the stage, please give a warm catalyst appreciation for Mr. Ian Powell with the Freedom Movement. Evening. I'm very excited to speak this evening. There's lots of things I want to share. First thing I need to get straight is that this isn't about the freedom movement. That was totally Dave's presumption. Oh, was it free man? <laughs> well, free man movement. And, uh, and I do not identify myself as being a free man uh, whatsoever. Um, I was, and my, my, there's a little issue about names as well, which for anyone who's investigated the free man movement at all, they will understand why I will choose to, to specify and wish to be accurate on the subject of names. So, I was born into this life a free, nameless, little blob of flesh and bone. And, um, and I was nameless in the drawing of that first breath. And then my alleged parents, I've got no means of actually knowing whether or not they are my genuine parents, apparently called me Ian, and I'm of the family Powell. Um, and most people now know me as Ian. Uh, I'm commonly known as Ian. Uh, I've chosen that, and you'll notice that it's all in uh, it's all in lowercase letters. And there's a reason for that, um, which I don't even particularly feel to go into. Uh, it's a distinction between me, the living flesh, the the human being, the spirit that is breathing life into this physical form, and a, a government corporation, Mister Ian Powell which I no longer identify with. So if you want to be my friend, you're more than welcome to call me Ian. If you say, are you Mr. Ian Powell? I will generally respond by asking, and who are you exactly? That's how I respond to most phone calls now. Anyway, I'm not here to, I'm guessing that there's a fair number of you that would have looked at a little bit the, the free man movement. Am I, am I right? Could I have a show of hands that even knows what a person is as to be distinguished from an, a norm? Okay, not many of you. Okay. Well, I've got some great news, guys. Um, because we have, for some time, been faced with enormous problems in our society. And... I certainly have experienced a great deal of apathy and confusion and frustration as wondering how I can possibly begin to be effective as a human being trying to take on a system that is armed with guns and, 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 and water cannons and nuclear weapons. And it's been very clear since my childhood that protest is, is just an absolute waste of time. Protest is generally a media circus. The Occupy movement in London just was, just was crushed a couple of days ago. Uh, and I, per personally, I wasn't at all bothered about that. You know, I don't actually see protest as being a means of achieving remedy in this society. But remedy is at hand, and it's been carefully hidden from us. And I'm here to share the good news, because there is a means for us actively changing the way this society works. It's going to require a small amount of study. It's not something that is just going to fall from the sky. Uh, and something that I, uh, an adage that was shared with me a while ago uh, was ignorance and freedom cannot coexist. And that's why I'm particularly happy to talk to this group of people because you are catalysts, that's why you've been drawn here, and you're generally fairly educated people. You know that language holds a great deal of power. And by us examining a little bit our language and the tricks that have been played on us, we can free ourselves from the system as it works. Not in denial of it, this is why I don't identify with the free man concept as it's sold to a lot of people, which is like, pull yourself out of the system, try and distance yourself from all that's you know, been created. I think this system is beautiful. But it's not functioning effectively. There's a huge amount of corruption. Uh, there's a huge about, uh, amount of misuse of power. And there is remedy at hand. So I'll, I'll just move on. Now, somebody earlier on picked up on the fact the title of this, of this talk is actually The Race from Dishonour. Um, and someone 
asked me exactly what he thought honour was, or what I thought honour was, and he's kind of blown my talk out of the water because it seemed that honour was actually a very difficult thing to define. Um, personally, I think honour is something that we intuit, that we feel. Somebody suggested that maybe it's something we can only learn by example, which is a bit worrying for those people who have never had an honourable example to follow. But just for the sake of moving on, and <laughs> not taking too long, I'm just going to presume that we, in some part of our body, know what honour is. So why am I saying the race from dishonour? Uh, there's a maxim of law. A maxim is a truth in law. It's something you can cite in court. It is, um, it, it's, it's seen as an overarching principle of law. Does anyone know how to complete this? He who dishonours... Loses, yes. He who dishonours loses. And in court cases, it is absolutely fundamental that we stay in honour, that we behave nobly, and that we conduct ourselves as honourable individuals. The minute that we fall into dishonour, we're done. That's it. Game over. And that's where the state, police, lawyers, judges have the ability to just say, thanks guys, you're coming where we tell you to go. Now... Because I was concerned that most of you would actually have a good grasp of what the Freeman movement was and what a person is, I thought I would start with something which you would definitely or very unlikely know anything about. Does anyone know what a commercial lien is? There's two or three of you. <laughs> so, a, a commercial lien is the most potent paper weapon we have at our disposal. It is capable of bringing down governments, corporations, and corrupt officials. You can hold them personally liable and accountable for any act of dishonour. That could be from the unlawful administering of a parking ticket up to the pollution of our rivers, the pollution of our skies, deception in business, Governments, insider trading, it is all, all attackable, not just attackable, we can, I don't like the, the, the idea of attack. The way I like to think about this is a commercial lien is a way of taking an unruly child and just putting your hand on top of his head as he's trying to punch you in the gut and just going, there you go son, just stay right where you are until he runs out of breath. That's what a commercial lien is. It's pronounced lien, it comes from the Latin origin link to chain, and it's a means of applying a paper ball and chain around someone so that they are ineffective commercially. And just to, when I say commercially, it's worth pointing out that everything we do is business. You know when we hear mafio mafiosos in, in films saying uh, it's just business, it's all just business. We are all in commerce with each other all the time, even in our sexual relationships. Anyway. I can't expand on that too much right now, just, just, just to get your ears picked up. So, um, and I'm not talking about the exchange of money. Now, common law is something that gets spoken a lot about. Common law is common sense. You cannot write it down. We can attempt to write it down, but that is also something that we intuit. Now, I'll come back to common law. So, people are not persons. You are all people. You are spirits bringing these life forms, these physical bodies, animating them into some kind of uh, thing resembling life. <laughs> Persons are actually a corporation. Your Mr. Ian Powell is a corporation. He has been brought into existence on paper so that he can trade with other corporations like governments. So, for instance, if you imagine the Monopoly board... I, as the player, Ian, I have a piece on the Monopoly board called Mr. Ian Powell. And he goes round and he can get sent to jail and he can pick up money and he pays rent. And he goes round this game of life, which is run by a Monopoly. So anyway, that's the distinction. So all of you people have persons. You are not persons, you have a person. And when you can see that distinction, suddenly... The world of paper seems a lot less intimidating. So there's all sorts of legal fictions. 
Now, a fiction is written by an author, is it not? And does anyone else here feel like they are the author of their own destiny? We are the dreamers of the dream, are we not? I like to think I am. I am the music maker. Well, there are all sorts of legal fictions that we have created by the stroke of a pen. Corporations, governments, persons, acts and statutes, lawyers, judges, policy men. A lawyer or a judge isn't a, per isn't a living form. He is a living form acting as this legal fiction. He's created a role, and that's why government judicial officials wear costumes. That's why they wear wigs, and they have... It's a piece of theatre. That's why they have acts, and they are acting under a certain role, under a certain title, just as Mr. is a title, Judge is a title. So we always have to remember that the people that we're dealing with in commerce, in business, are, are not people, they are persons. We've got to remember that there's a, a living, breathing thing underneath the exterior. So, contract equals law. This is a really important thing to remember. We, we think that law is the, is the legislation, the, the, the huge tombs of acts and statutes that have been handed down by the government. That is not the case. Okay, that, that is not law, it is legislation. Contract is law. And we are contracting with each other all the time. And sometimes we write down our contracts. And when we write down a contract, we have created law. Now, silent acquiescence is a thing that many people don't know about. Does anyone know what that means? So I've chosen a good topic, because I was really concerned I'd be boring, with, boring you. <laughs> so, um, I am. <laughs> well, hopefully this will get interesting for you in a minute. Um, I'm passing a new law here. Uh, I'm really glad that um, David uh, gave me uh, the authority this evening to... Uh, in fact, tonight there's a new law of the catalyst, and that is the favourite speaker of the, of the evening. Your favourite speaker, you have to buy a drink for them. That's a new law. Okay? Well, I'm sorry to say, guys, you just fell at the first hurdle. You all silently acquiesced with my law. I spoke a law into being and I gave you a notice of it. And like a bunch of sheep, you all sat there and said, OK. You, uh, there wasn't one murmur of protest. And this is what governments do to us all the time. This is what corporations do to us all the time. They send us... How, how, how often do we get a letter from our electricity supply saying we're putting up our prices? That's them giving us notice. We've got a contract with them. They give us notice. And because we don't challenge it, it becomes law. We have 30 days, or depends on actually who you're dealing with and how they've set the terms of it. We've always got a certain amount of time to say, I don't agree. And if we don't agree, then we have a, a, a means to be able to voice our concerns. And the problem where we've got to in this society is that none of us have been taught that we have a choice. When someone tells us, I'm going to put up your prices, I'm going to create this new law that says that you can do X, Y, or Z, we all have a choice to say no, and we don't, because we haven't known how to. We've been sold an idea of democracy, that people are representing us and that they're working on our behalf, and it's a total game. It's like the oldest game in the book. It is like hundreds of years old, which is why we don't see it. And I have been through a, a, a times harrowing process in the last couple of years, realising the degree to which I'm not a free man, and seeing a game that, that at times I felt so uh, you know, objectionable, I, I've, I've literally cried tears. I've got children and I'm deeply concerned about the world that they're going to grow up in. But then, somebody shared with me a particularly beautiful perspective with which we can regard this life. And it is a game. And we can make the rules up as we go along. We all have that ability. And if we learn to use our voices, and learn how to act honourably, and express our feelings and needs in on paper, not even just on paper, there's a lot of potential with what we can do. 
All contracts must have four components. They must have an offer and an acceptance. I am making you an offer in this, in this talk. I'm saying, would you like to believe what I'm telling you? And you are faced with a choice of whether or not you accept what I say is truth. So every interaction, every time I scratch my eyes with my ears suggestively at you, I'm making you an offer. And how you choose to respond is going to dictate how we're going to do business. <laughs> so they, all contracts have an offer and an acceptance. They must have full disclosure of the terms and conditions if it's going to be an honourable contract. They must have equal consideration, which means, that's a whole talk in itself almost, but it means that both people have to give something to the contract. So if we're having an employment contract, I'm giving you my time, you give me your money. We have to both be giving something. And recently somebody did a talk here about the banking system, and just so you know, all of your bank loans, all of your credit card loans, everything is completely fraudulent because there's no equal consideration. They never actually gave us any money. It's the biggest scam ever. Anyway, I'm not going to go into that either. Uh, and there has to be the demonstration of content, uh, consent uh, of both parties, either by their conduct or if it's a written contract, by two wet signatures. Two people have to have signed it, which is another reason why all our bank and credit card contracts are totally fraudulent. So anyway, there's four ways you can respond to an offer. Two of them are dishonourable. Uh, one of them is silent acquiescence. One of them is dispute. If I make you an offer and you start going, I don't like your offer. You're just disputing the offer. And that is not honourable. There's only two ways to honourably deal with an offer. One of them is acceptance. And the second one is conditional acceptance. And if you take anything away from tonight... I really urge you to go and explore the concept of conditional acceptance. It is where we can empower ourselves in all our human interactions. Somebody makes an offer to us, like the little scratch, and we go, okay, on condition that you send, me your pro you send me your claim for a penalty notice for my parking fine, I say, fine, that's okay, but just on the condition that you can show me that you've got a legitimate claim. I've got a mantra that I learned from a very clever man called Gordon Hall, and it's like, um, I conditionally accept your offer upon proof of bona fide claim. That is a, a mantra that is just embedded in my head now, and it's a way that I've heard people get out of interactions in court, interactions in police, and that, with the police, and this is why there's this whole free man thing, because there are people who are exercising this sort of technology and assuring their freedom. I know a man who's danced out of court with the smile and the blessing of the judges because he has been able to express himself with honour, with clarity, like a grown man, not like a child that's going, I think you're wrong to be playing this game of life with me and abusing my powers. He's like, actually, no, I understand the game that you're playing. I understand why you do it because there are dangerous people in this society and we have to like... The nanny state is there waiting for the child to grow up and show that it can handle its business and its affairs with maturity and with clarity. So conditional acceptance. Now I'm concerned because you're giving me the nod. I've got two more slides to go. Trespass. We've all heard about trespass. It's very important that we understand this as a concept. I mentioned the common law earlier, and the common law can be resumed by this five or six word statement. My, no, your rights end where mine begin. Your rights end where mine begin. This is my world, this is my domain. You cannot tell me what to do if, as long as I'm not causing any harm to anybody else, you cannot tell me what to do. This is my life. This is my boundary right here. That's why we are so upset by rape and abuse and violence, because it is somebody encroaching on somebody else's rights. That hurts our sense of honour, that broaches the common sense that every man has and woman has a right to live in peace with each other, nobly, in love. 
So trespass is the minute that someone goes beyond that boundary and starts telling you what to do. We've all hated it since, since we were children. And we were brought up in a society where people have been doing that for 5,000 years. Literally, we can trace back the hierarchical, patriarchal game that's been played for about 5,000 years to a time where people didn't tell each other what to do, thinking that they had the authority to do it. So yeah, trespass, your rights end where mine begin. Well, my final anecdote is to do with a guy called Guy Uden. Um, Guy Uden is a scrap merchant from the UK, common man. He is not educated like in the traditional sense. All right, geese, this is what we're talking about, right? He's been educating himself, and he knows what a commercial lien is. And he is scaring the shit out of people. Oh dear, I was going to try and not swear, but I'm quite passionate about this. Guy Uden has issued commercial liens against all sorts of people, including his council. The council tried to tell him what to do on a certain point to do with his land and business that he was doing. He said, you're overstepping the mark. He went through this private administrative process, which is something that you can learn. It's just a load of letters that you have to send to someone. He tied it up into a commercial lien. Uh, the council had a, certain, had a surprise one day when he turned up at their offices with a big white van and started picking up their computers and sticking them in the back of his van. And the police were called and turned up and looked at his paperwork, which was properly notarised and had gold and red seals all over it. And the police said, yeah, he's got the authority to do this. <laughs> and we can all do that. It is not brain surgery. And there will be questions in a second. And the thing that gives us that power is an affidavit of truth. An affidavit of truth can only be signed by a living human being, not by a legal fiction. And so we are armed. We can make these paper mountains, these legal fictions, bow to our force. And there are many people who are educating themselves about this around the world. I've, I've, there's a group of people called the Creditors in Commerce that are... A, power to behold, and they are going to be holding corporations to account for pollution, for corruption, and we all have that power, and we could all participate in it. If you have this much know-how, if you've got the willingness to learn, you can absolutely free yourself from all slavery, which I define as where someone forces you to do something against your will. And my guess is that you're all paying mortgages, rent, council tax, tax in your... And, and where is that tax going? That tax is going to blow up innocent children around the world in our names. Is that what we were here to do? That's a lot of information for probably a bit more than 15 minutes. There's a website called Free Beings where I've tried to compile really enjoyable films that will lead you down all of these different areas, explaining the ins and outs of contract law, the money system, the judicial system, and I implore you, I request with all my heart and soul that you look into this, because if we don't, we are this close to finding ourselves in a full-on police state. Now, I am someone who has no fear in me and recently I've stopped paying all my debts and all my loans and all my taxes and nobody has managed to hold me, nobody has managed to get me so far, touch wood. And if they do I'll go to prison for it because I, I believe in it. What I'm saying is that since I've been investigating this I've had a sense of liberation in my life that I would just implore you all to look into because it's a new world that I'm experiencing. And that whole threat of a police state, I don't buy it. I believe that we're on the verge of a big wake-up. So, uh, bless. Thank you for your attention. Oh, that was quite a lot, so... Thank you. Probably don't have much time for questions. Just, just a quick question. In the States, there's... Um no legal precedent for actually having to pay tax. No. Um, but Wesley Snipes tried to go up against that and they put him in jail. Yes, now there's a very interesting thing about this, because where you have a lawyer represent you, you are stuffed. 
I know people who have given lawyers so much of their money in divorce hearings and, and all sorts of business hearings. Lawyers only have... Do you remember I was talking about the four ways of responding to an offer? A lawyer is only allowed to dispute or to accept. The, off, the, the ability to conditionally accept isn't open to a lawyer. They are a legal fiction who is duty-bound to the law society that they become members of, to become a member of a bar association, they swear an oath to the lawyer, uh, to, the, to, the, to the law society, and therefore when they are in court, which is like a tennis court, it's just a game, don't take it too seriously, it's just a game, we're batting the ball back and, backwards and forwards between each other, paper balls. Anyway, the, um, a lawyer doesn't actually have the ability to conditionally accept and that's to keep the whole judicial game going. So don't ever go into court with a lawyer. You have like a 3 or 4% chance, statistically, of coming out alive. They are there to enforce the system and make money out of us. So really think twice before you engage a lawyer. Because if you know a little bit about contract law, it's really not that big a thing you will be able to stand and represent yourself. And Wesley Snipes, I can't imagine he went in and said, Sir, <laughs> I am here as a living, breathing... <laughs> you know, my sense is he would have stuck in an army of lawyers in front of him and, and they would have made a lot of money out of it. Any other questions? Um, if the, the governments and the legal systems and the big businesses are going to all sort of tie them together, if this is sort of a, a genuine threat to that authority... Is there no way that they will be able to sort of close the... This is, this is, the, this is the amazing thing. So everybody... Can you, can you, sorry, can you repeat the question? Please? Yeah, I will do. So there is a concern which frequently comes up, which is that um, people say, OK, so if this, this whole like, new means of dealing with law... It's not a new thing, it's very old, but we're just learning about it now. If this is such a potent threat to corporations and governments and authorities, isn't it possible they could just re-legislate and shut it down? The thing is, legislation is a legal fiction. It's just written on paper by another legal fiction. So when you have legal fictions writing legal fictions, right, in the pecking order, it's right down there. We are the sovereign beings. There's God, if you believe in that or not. There's the all that is... And then we grew out of that world, and we are just one under that all that is. There's nothing in between us and the ultimate creator, like whatever name you want to give that, however you perceive that. I'm not a religious person. Um, so the governments are given our authority by us. It's us, the authors, that created these fictions. And when we truly understand this, there's no legislation they can ever write that is going to change that. And when we truly know how to contract, anything is possible. And believe me, I know of people that have been got out of jail, corporations that have been taken down. It's a very exciting thing that we will never hear about in the media, ever. Thank you very much. Well, the catalyst is about coming and expressing your passion, and I think it's fair to say that Iam's talk is one of the most, talk is one of the most passionate we've had in a long while. So, um, thank you, Iam.